Greetings. Um, let's uh, talk a little bit about uh, the lymph or the lymphatic system uh, as it plays a very important role in immunity. So um, I think uh, we in some of the previous videos talked about the different white blood cells, right? So uh, we had the lymphocytes, right? The B and T lymphocytes. So what does site mean? Site means cells. Lymph means uh, lymph, the system, the, the organs of lymph. So the cells that are developed in the, the lymph and are mature in the lymph are lymphocytes. And we talked about B and T cell lymphocytes, right? Um, so, so that's where the name comes from. Um, so, so what are the organs of the lymphatic system? Or, or the, or, you know, so we have uh, the organ where the uh, cells are created. So that's the bone marrow, right? So we talked about that. Uh, and so bone marrow is a primary lymphoid organ. Um, and then uh, thymus is where the T lymphocytes mature. So again, that's a primary lymphoid organ as well. So the primary organs are organs there where the um, lymphocytes uh, uh, cr get created and mature. So th those are the two big primary lymphoid organs. And then of course we have the secondary lymphoid organs and this is where these uh, lymphocytes circulate. So you have the lymph channels and the lymph nodes, and then you have the spleen. So let's, let's review uh, them a little bit closely and see if we can gain a better understanding of what they are, okay? So let's first start with the uh, lymphatic system, okay? So this is again heart, and circulatory system. So on a very simple level, a very simple level, again you have blood uh, which has been oxygenated uh, by the lungs and it's in the left ventricle of the heart and the left ventricle squeezes and pushes the blood through the aorta into the arterial system. So it goes into the artery, goes into the arteriole, goes into the capillary and then it goes into a venule, into a vein, and then again goes back into the um, into the uh, right side of the heart, in the right ventricle, okay, to the right side of the heart, into the right atria. My bad. So this is the right atria where this goes again. Okay. So that's sort of a simple. Uh, way it gets circulated. So let's kind of dig in. So again, if you see the arteries and arterioles are mostly oxygenated blood and venules and veins are deoxygenated blood. And when we work on vascular system, we're going to study this a bit more closely. But let's go to the capillary level because that's where the magic is happening. Okay. And see what's going on there. Okay. So this is a capillary. Okay and the blood is coming in here and the blood is going out this way okay so at this level there are two forces that come to pass which determine whether the fluid remains in the blood vessel or remain or goes outside the blood vessel so again this is this is inside the blood vessel so that is intravascular okay and then this is outside the blood vessel but not within the cell so this is interstitial okay space okay right so what are the two forces so the first force is the hydrostatic force that pushes the fluid out that's the force with which the blood is going through these pipes and what generates 
this hydrostatic force. It's generated by the left ventricle of the heart that squeezes that blood with certain force. And that's what we measure when we do our blood pressure. So there's a higher number and a lower number. So for example, here, it's going to be 90 over 60. And we're just taking an example here, okay? So again, we have 90 over 60. That's the force that's pushing this blood out of the blood vessel, okay? Now again, these are two pressures. So if we were to come up with one number, which gives us an average of what the pressure is going to be, uh, we can use mean arterial pressure or MAP. So how do we calculate MAP? So let's just do this. MAP equals systolic plus 2 times diastolic divided by 3, right? So here, the top number, which is systolic, is 90. Lower number is diastolic is 60. Okay, so what's the mean arterial pressure? It's going to be 90 plus 2 times 60 divided by 3, and that's going to be 70. So that's the average pressure that's pushing this fluid out. Okay. Now, when this when this blood gets to closer to the venous side. Right? So this is closer to the venous side. This is closer to the arterial side. The pressure is not as high as it was here. Why is that? Well, because it's further away from the left ventricle of the heart or the pump. So let's say here the pressure is 60 over 30. Or if you do a mean arterial pressure, again it's 60 plus 2 times 30 divided by 3, which is 40. 40 millimeters of mercury. Okay, so again, you have that hydrostatic force at these two points pushing the fluid out. Now, there's a second force which is called the oncotic force, and this pulls the fluid in. Now, this is determined by the albumin or the protein content of the blood that's in the vascular space. Okay, so again you have fluid being fluid getting pushed out by hydrostatic force and fluid getting pulled in by oncotic force. So here I have 70 millimeters of mercury that's pushing this fluid out and 50 millimeters of oncotic force or oncotic pressure that's pulling this fluid in. So there's a net movement of 20 millimeters mercury that's pushing this fluid out. So it is actually normal and natural that on a capillary level, the blood that's coming in tends to go in the interstitial space. Okay. Now, closer to the venous side of things, if you see the oncotic force remains the same, the hydrostatic force goes down. It's 40 and the oncotic is 50. So it's actually pulling some of that fluid in. Okay, with me on this? So that's the, the, the balance is where you have the fluid that's pushed out here and then you have the fluid that's pulled back in. Well, hmm, is there a reason for this? And the answer is yes. There is a very, very good reason for this. What we want to do is we want the fluid that has all the good stuff to bathe the cell and the cell wall. And for that, we need it out. We need it out of the, 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 the blood vessel. So we do want that fluid to go out, give the stuff to the cell, and then get pulled back in. Right? Yeah, makes perfect sense. Now, ideally, if you've got some amount of fluid going out, you want the same amount of fluid to go in, right? 
because if you don't then you have a net amount of fluid that remains here and that causes edema me on this that causes edema it causes edema so as you can see from my example you had 20 that pushed a lot of fluid out a net of 20 and then you had a net of 10 here that pulled in half of that fluid back in but you still had some residual fluid so if we only consider the arterial and venous circulation um, this actually gives rise to a higher likelihood of the fluid remaining in the interstitial space and there being increased edema but that doesn't come to pass and that is one of the big reasons that that is one of the 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 big functions of lymph nodes and lymph channels so essentially this interstitial space this interstitial space empties into a lymph channel okay so this residual fluid actually goes in which is in the interstitial space goes into a lymph channel that's why you don't have edema now what if your lymph channels are not doing their job what are you gonna have edema right or if you have issues where the lymph channels are not able to move this residual fluid what are you gonna have edema related to lymph channels not working lymphedema makes sense right see that's how easy this is so again you have residual fluid that is as a result of this interaction on a capillary level here so that residual fluid is good it gave the cell the, 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 the good stuff that it needed but it needs to now move out so it moves from the interstitial space to lymph channels and then it goes to lymph nodes now lymph nodes have all the lymph nodes in the lymph channels drain into two areas the left side of your body drains into the left thoracic duct and the right side of the body is right lymphatic duct okay so again you have the left and the right side and depending on which side of the body is are we talking about with the lymph channels and the lymph nodes that's the area that it drains to and then both of them drain back into the venous system and they go into the circulation so that's beautiful here this system lymph system is providing a channel where fluid that gets out of the circulatory system goes back in the circulatory system that's beautiful that's amazing and that's one of the big functions of the lymphatic system is it manages this particular part of the circulation well the other thing that it does and this is what makes it really really interesting is lymph nodes are reservoirs for B and T cells okay they are reservoirs for B and T cells and interstitial space is where you're having all the soldiers cells of WBCs and the cytokines a lot of them are working there so you have a lot of antigen presenting cells that are activated lots of antigens lots of good and bad things that go with that extra fluid into the lymph channels and they go to the lymph nodes which are housing the B and T cells so there the lymph nodes get a chance to inspect this extra fluid for bad guys debris 
and because it's housing the B and T cells it can now mount an immune response so not only is it circulatory in nature it's also has an immune function that is associated with it okay make sense so that's the lymph system and the 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 role of lymph nodes and the lymph channels okay so again we talked about the organs of the lymphatic system so we had the thymus and the bone marrow they are the primary lymphoid organs why because we develop and mature the the lymphocytes there and then lymph nodes and spleen are secondary that's where they circulate and they get used and they they go you know they, they end up so to speak there so that's why they're the secondary lymphoid organs we talked a little bit about function of the lymphatic system so remember fluid management just looked at how the extra fluid at the capillary level gets routed back into circulation but that's not enough the lymph nodes actually inspect this fluid for antigens for pathogens for malignant cells for toxins the debris all the bad stuff and then again we mount an immune response here very very important and then of course the thymus is where the maturation of T cells is now do you remember where B cells mature you got it it's the bone marrow B cells mature in bone marrow T cells have to come out they go to the thymus and that's where they mature so again that's the function of the lymphatic system okay good so let's kind of talk a little bit more about lymph nodes and the lymph node anatomy okay so again remember the channels so you have the capillary and then you have some fluid that's remaining over goes into lymph channel and then this ends up in these little tiny lymph nodes okay and so this is what we're going to talk about is lymph nodes and their anatomy so again it's encapsulated so there's a capsule around it around the lymph nodes okay and it's trabecular so it's kind of like a mesh like sieve like structure okay and it's got things that are coming in that that are channels that are letting stuff in it that's called afferent starting with an a see how it's going in and then it's got a channel where it count things come out of which is called efferent efferent external coming out efferent so you have the afferent and the efferent okay medulla it's the innermost layer you have the cortex which is the outermost and then you have the paracortex which is in the middle so the fluid actually moves through these three layers and circulates and goes through and interfaces with cortex paracortex and medulla and generally there's B cells in cortex and T cells in paracortex and this is where the fluid is inspected and you know your B and T cell responses are mounted so the lymph fluid is inspected and the immune response is mounted and the fluid comes out of here out of the efferent pathway and then again goes into all of them empty out into the either the left or the right side 
and uh, they go into certain areas and I'm gonna have if you don't remember what it is go back to the video uh, a few seconds ago a few minutes ago and then see if you're on the left side what do you empty into if you're in the right side what you're emptying into right and then what do you do you empty into the venous system so extra circulation gets back into the circulation extra fluid gets back into the circulation and then of course we make sure that the immune response is mounted and the debris is cleared okay excellent so that's lymph nodes spleen is the second organ I think we're going to talk a bit more about spleen uh, in hematological systems or hematology uh, uh, you know, but here I'll give you the WBC part of it. So again, this is spleen. So how's it different from lymph node? So remember in lymph node we had what? We had an afferent and we had an efferent. Efferent is going out, afferent is going in. Here in the spleen you only have efferent. It's going out. So what goes in? It's actually the blood vessels that go in. So again, you have the splenic artery, again coming from the aorta, uh, and the splenic artery, it empties into the spleen, and then you have the splenic vein, which joins the inferior mesenteric, which is draining the large intestine, and superior mesenteric, which is draining the small intestine, and it goes to the liver uh, through hepatic portal vein. Okay, and then goes to the heart. Okay, so that's the circulation. But why is the circulation important? Why do I care? So it's interesting. Um, let's say I have an issue with my liver, and and we have pathologies such as liver cirrhosis, where the the liver is scarred. Okay, and it's preventing. Uh, blood from f flowing freely through here. So what's going to happen? There's going to be a backup, right? Because this blood's coming in, but this blood is not allowed to go out. So what's going to happen? Well, there's going to be backup here, backup here, and backup here, right? So the spleen's going to get bigger. And these in superior and inferior mesenteric vessels are going to become engorged. And their fluid pressure is going to increase. And that fluid, remember hydrostatic force is going to go up. That's going to force that fluid out. Okay. So again, when we start to look at pathologies, diseases, you'll see why we are covering this uh, this time. But at this time, again, this is how the spleen is set up in our body. It is encapsulated and trabecular, just like with lymph nodes. So the only difference so far is what? The efferent, it has an efferent channel, but not an afferent A channel. Okay? What's the role? Well, the blood comes in here, and it filters the blood. It looks at the RBCs that are old and abnormal and it gets rid of them. So it has a lot of RBCs. Lots of RBCs. Okay. Well, of course it's also a big organ of uh, uh, you know, a, a lymph system. So it has lots of macrophages. In fact, 50% of body's macrophages. Okay. Now, just remember, lymph nodes, do, lymph nodes do not drain into the spleen. Why? There is no afferent channel. So, they don't. Something to remember. Now, that we know these two functions, let's say I am involved in a car wreck. I'm never involved in a car wreck, but let's say it's a big trauma that I'm involved in, motor vehicle accident, and I actually have a ruptured spleen. 
what do you think will that predispose me to? I have lots of RBCs. That blood's not going to remain in circulation. It's going to spill out. Okay. So again, it's going to cause an issue acutely, right? Now, also, it has a lot of macrophages. So, not immediately, but let's say I recover. And now I'm doing good. Uh, somebody took out my spleen. Okay. Because it was bleeding, somebody had to go and take out the spleen and ligate that blood vessel. Okay. Can I live? Yes, I will. But my RBCs are not going to go through their life cycle the best way. So, I'll start to see some funny little cells on under my microscope. We'll talk, talk more about that in hematology. Since we're in the immune system, what's going to happen is that my immune system will not have this reservoir of macrophages. So, what am I going to be at risk for? Infection. Infection. That's a big, big aspect of this. So, you see, from anatomy, I can figure out, hey, I had a patient that doesn't have their spleen. What's going to happen? Okay? So that's spleen. The last organ we'll talk about is the thymus. And we'll just do it very, very briefly. So thymus, again, remember, it's on in your mediastinum. sitting on the top of the heart. Again, uh, this is generally an organ which is very functioning very well at our, when we are young. Then as we get older, it atrophies and it becomes fibrous. Okay, So it doesn't function as well. And what it's doing is, it is where T-cells go to mature. Okay, so that's what, that's all thymus does. So the question is, well, what does that mean? So again, we'll talk a bit more about it. But cells, the T cells, there's different kinds. There's cells, T cells that have a CD4 marker. There's cells that have a CD8 marker. So if you have a cell that is a CD8 marker, that is a T cytotoxic cell. If you have a T cell with a CD4 marker, it's a T helper cell, right? So there's different kinds of T cells. So this is, so in this gland, the T cells get there. And the step one is they go through a process where they're examined to see if they have these markers. Okay. They have these markers. They have these proteins on their surfaces. And if they do, they go to step two. What's the step two? The step two is that it does not bind to a self-antigen. What does self-antigen mean? Marker, remember marker or tag on your cells. So if this T cell is able to mark, is able to bind to a marker on your body cell, that's not good. Because that means that T cell will have the ability to now tag and potentially kill your own healthy self cells. Not good. In fact, that's some of what happens in autoimmunity, where you have cells which are immune cells, and they're able to bind to 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 self to, to their own cells, to their own healthy selves. So again. That's the second stage. So any cell that doesn't have CD4 or CD8, it gets whacked. Okay? Gets whacked. The second step is 
is it able to bind to any of the proteins in my body? If yes, kill it. I don't want that. I don't want that. And then once it makes sure that it's got the right markers and it's not able to bind to my proteins or my body's protein, it allows those cells to propagate and move on. And that is called positive selection because these cells have been positively selected. If they don't have the correct markers for CD4, CD8, and or, or they, they are able, they're binding to your own healthy antigens on your own healthy cells, these cells got to die because they're no good. They're going to damage you. And that's called negative selection. Because these people, these, these bad cells can damage because they're A, no good. They don't function, don't have the right markers. Or they can damage your healthy cells by tagging or by holding on to the tags on the cell. And these are healthy cells. And so this is... So these are cells that need to be destroyed and these this is called negative selection. So the, this is what the thymus does. Now you know what's interesting? Remember what tolerance is? So in one of the previous lectures we talked about how our immune system needs to tolerate our own body and not tolerate foreign, right? So this is a, a mechanism, this is a mechanism called central tolerance. So in other words, at the time, centrally when these cells are created, and matured, we make sure that the mechanisms are in place where they are able to tolerate own body, central tolerance.